Our bomba is a product of Soviet ingenuity and a testament to the immense destructive potential of nuclear weapons. Developed at the height of the Cold War, this bomb was the ultimate demonstration of the Soviet Union's power, a weapon designed to terrify the entire world. It is the world's most powerful weapon ever created by man. In this video, we will learn how the Tsar Bomba works and what it consists of, find out what would happen if the USSR dropped the Tsar Bomba on London, learn the history of the Tsar Bomba, and also with the help of artificial intelligence, we created a digital double academician Sakharov, the man who created the Tsar Bomba, and find out what he thinks about it. In 1961, amid an intensifying arms race, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev commissioned the development of the most powerful bomb ever created. The task fell to Andrei Sakharov and his team of scientists, who had to push the boundaries of existing nuclear technology to create this monster. The bomb weighed 27 tons and measured 8 meters long and 2 meters in diameter. It turned out that no airplane could lift this bomb. To transport the giant, it was necessary to specially modify the plane TU-95, as well as to install on its special mounts because of the huge size of the bomb could not be placed inside. But what really distinguished the Tsar Bomba was its power. It was estimated to be about 58 megatons of TNT. If you compare it to the current US missile LGM-30 Minuteman III, the Tsar Bomba is 193 times more powerful and if you compare it to the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, it is 3,866 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The height of the mushroom from the King Bomb is 67 kilometers. It's 80 towers of the Burj Khalifa stacked on top of each other. Its top point is impossible to see. It's three times the height of airplane flights. The mechanics of the Tsar Bomba were amazing. It was a hydrogen bomb so powerful that another nuclear bomb was used to detonate it. The Tsar Bomba consists of three parts. The first part is like a trigger called a primer. This is the nuclear bomb that is needed to detonate the main part. It has a yield of 1.5 megaton. The second part is the fusion charge. The substance is usually made up of uranium or plutonium, and it has atoms fissioning. This fission causes the release of neutrons, which collide with other atoms and fission them. The result is an increase in temperature, up to tens of millions of degrees. The contribution of this part of the bomb is 50 megatons. The third part is similar to the second part and adds another 50 megatons to the explosive power. However, this option was rejected because of fears of extremely high levels of radioactive contamination. The leader of the USSR asked for a reduction in the power of the Tsar Bomba. Therefore, the Tsar Bomba tested had a modified third stage, where the uranium components were replaced by a lead equivalent. This reduced the estimated total explosive yield to 58 megatons. Note the back of the bomb. This is the place for the parachute. It was decided to drop the bomb from the airplane on several parachutes to slow its fall as much as possible and to allow the airplane to fly as far away from the explosion site as it could. On October 30th, 1961, the Tsar Bomba was dropped over the remote archipelago of Novaya Zemlya in the Arctic Ocean. The ensuing explosion was nothing short of apocalyptic. The fireball reached a diameter of 8 kilometers and the mushroom cloud soared to a height of 67 kilometers. The windows shattered at a distance of 900 kilometers, and the shock wave circled the globe three times. The shock wave from the Tsar Bomba explosion traveled faster than the speed of sound, reached the airplane, and kicked it. This kick accelerated the plane by 100 kilometers per hour, and then the plane plummeted sharply downward about a kilometer. Three crew members lost consciousness. Major Durnovsev fortunately remained conscious. He managed to land the plane on the mainland Air Force Base, almost 500 kilometers away from the explosion. Major Durnovtsev was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union and the military rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Despite its ominous power, the Tsar Bomba played a peacemaking function for mankind. In fact, the Tsar Bomba stopped the arms race.
The U.S., USSR, and Britain two years after the test realized the futility of the nuclear race and concluded the first treaty in history to ban the testing of nuclear weapons. Let's see what if history had unfolded very differently and the USSR had detonated the bomb not in a deserted place in the New Earth archipelago, but in London, for example. A fireball as hot as the sun would reach a radius of three and a half miles from Brixton in the south to Camden Town in the north. Anyone caught in it won't even know what's happened. People will just disappear in a matter of milliseconds. The 100% mortality radius will be from Chiswick in the west to Greenwich in the east, a radius of five and a half miles. Within a 15-mile radius, buildings will be destroyed, and within a radius of 34 miles, from Reading to South End on Sea and Luton to Brighton, everything that can burn will catch fire, and people within that radius will receive third-degree burns. The death toll from the King Bomb in London would be nearly six million people and about three and a half million injured. We have analyzed all the articles, as well as interviews given by the creator of Tsar Bomba, Academician Sakharov, all the information that is available about him, and created a virtual simulation, which was asked to comment on the creation of the Tsar Bomba. I remember the excitement and trepidation during its development. Our goal was to secure the Soviet Union during a period of intense geopolitical tension. However, as the magnitude of the bomb's power became clearer, so did the moral and ethical implications of our work. I have often reflected on the words of my American colleague Robert Oppenheimer, who quoted the Bhagavad Gita. I have now become death, the destroyer of worlds. These words resonate deeply with me. As I matured and reflected on my work, I came to realize that the true path to security and peace lies not in the accumulation of more powerful weapons, but in our ability to control and ultimately eliminate them. My subsequent work has been dedicated to advocating for disarmament and human rights in the hope that future generations will not have to live under the shadow of such weapons. I apologize for creating this evil.